a great strategy will get you nowhere if you don't know how to put it into action. Were you taught to become CEO? That's a great question. Why you? It's a challenging question to answer. What did you do? Credibility, sincerity, reliability. You didn't know what you were doing. I have no idea what's going on. Don't be afraid. Don't think of what could go wrong with all the things that are going on. If you're authentic, if you're inspiring, if you're trustworthy, so will your company be. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today is Dave McLennan, Executive Chair and former CEO of Cargill. They are a global food and agribusiness corporation which employs uh, over 160,000 employees in 70 countries. Thank you for joining me, Dave. It's great to be with you, Jacob. Thanks for having me. A lot of people, and and I was one of those people, um, who have maybe heard of Cargill, but have not been super familiar with it and just quite how massive you are and the impact that you have. Uh, I read that you started uh, around 158 years ago, still a family-owned business. But if you were a publicly traded company, you would be what, like a Fortune 15, Fortune 10, something yeah, like that? 15 to 20, something like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy how huge uh, the business is. Uh, can you give a little bit of background information about the company and what you guys do? Sure. As you said, we're 158 years old, 1865. We're basically ag, food, and food ingredients. So everything from buying grains from farmers and putting it on barge, rail, ship, truck, getting it, moving it somewhere else around the world or domestically, or moving it to one of our facilities where we might convert wheat to flour, soybeans to soybean meal and soybean oil. We make ingredients like cocoa and chocolate. We have a bioindustrials business. We're very diverse. Uh, We also have an animal protein business. So we're in beef and poultry as well as turkeys. But as you mentioned, we're privately owned, family owned. We are on our seventh generation of family members. Um, We have several who are working for the company now, Uh, but it's unusual. I think typically a privately owned or family owned company last two generations, we're on seven. So for a lot of different reasons, we've beaten the odds. Yeah, no, it sounds like it. Um, So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, and admittedly, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to find as much information as I could about you. Uh, There's not a ton about you on social media, so I was doing a a lot of digging, a lot of reading to find as much uh, information as I could. And really what I wanted to do today, um, since you were the CEO of one of the world's largest companies, uh, like you said, Fortune 10, Fortune 20, I really wanted to unpack kind of the art and science of leadership and how you approached it, uh, because leading such a massive organization, you've probably developed some kind of unique approaches and things over time. So I thought maybe we could start with how you got into the CEO role. Mm. And is this something that you were prepared for? I mean, were you taught to become CEO or were you just kind of thrown into that role in that position? That's that's a great question. And as uh, as I mentioned, I, I just handed over the CEO responsibilities about five months ago. And... I, you become more reflective about your career, about your life. You know, where did the time go? And there's, I think there's really nothing that prepares you for being a CEO. Now, the company, we Cargill, do, I think, a good job of developing people for their next leadership opportunities. But I didn't wake up when I was a certain age or I didn't come to Cargill or even even within the years before I became CEO, I wasn't like, I want to be the CEO. Yeah, I thought, okay, if it happens, you know, if I'm chosen, great. And if I'm not, we'll see what happens then. But I think there are some people that d- design their career so that they can be CEO. But I always had a philosophy of, I'd like to be on the top leadership team of Cargill. If that means being CEO, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I was also CFO and I was COO. And one of the things that we do, Jacob, is we signal to the organization who's going to be the next CEO by creating temporarily a COO position. Hmm. So I was COO for about two and a half years. And that told the organization, here's who the next CEO is going to be. Uh, okay. And then my successor, Brian Sykes, was COO for roughly two years in the same way. Not all companies do that. But I have often said, and I mean this somewhat um, jokingly, but somewhat seriously, <laughs> I look back on my first year of being CEO. I did not know what I was doing. 
And I, I say that, as I said, facetiously, but you don't, everything changes when you get behind the desk. Yeah. And as much as you're prepared, knowing your company, knowing what you want to try and do, everything changes. Your jokes are funnier. People write down what you say. Uh, you're getting all kinds of requests for time. But I don't think anything truly prepares you, especially for your first couple of years in the job. And I think any CEO who tells you that is being dis- it said no. that they were prepared is being disingenuous. <laughs> One of the things I always ask uh, CEOs is why you? So obviously yeah. there were a lot of people who were in the role uh, or who were you know candidates for the role, a lot of people who who could have been in that <laughs> position. But for some reason you got picked. Uh, you know you you were right. the CEO. And so the question that I always like to ask is, is there something unique about you, whether it's a leadership hack, a strategy, something that you brought to the role that maybe other people didn't bring, which is what caused you to get that position? Mm. That's a that's a challenging question to answer because it would mean that you spend time thinking about yourself or, hey, what makes me unique? Um, and I don't like to think that way. But I think first and foremost, you have to show a history of business results, that you were able to take the business challenges that you were in, the business that you were given to manage and improve them, grow them, make them into something, transform them. And not everybody has that skill. Uh, sometimes it's innate, sometimes it's academic, but I think you've got to be show a, you've got to have a commercial sense uh, and the ability to grow a company and, and to, to make more profits. I think secondly, it's to uh, create followership. Uh, not, so there are some people that have great leadership skills, but they may not be able to communicate a vision or make an, a, a personal connection with those that they lead through authenticity, through transparency, through inspiration. And you're, you're nothing if you're not a leader if people aren't going to follow you. So it sounds kind of trite, yeah. but I think you have, to have the ability to make that personal connection with people. And I think that was, I'd like to think that was something I was able to do that, that maybe led to my getting the role. With hybrid work as the new normal, how are you collaborating securely and making sure your data is safe in the cloud? Avpoint has your back. Avpoint provides the most advanced platform to optimize SaaS operations and secure collaboration. No matter how big your business is or what it does, Avpoint can help you modernize your digital workplace. Over 17,000 companies trust Avpoint to rapidly reduce costs, improve productivity, and protect your data with their renowned Confidence Platform. Visit Avpoint today to get started and learn more. That's Avpoint, A-V-E-P-O-I-N-T dot com. Yeah, I I like the theme of followership. Um, So people who listen and watch this show know that at uh, October of this year, I have a book coming out called Leading with Vulnerability. Mm. Um, which which tackles some of that stuff in there too, but what is the difference between commanding followership from your title? Right, I mean you, you're the CEO. You could say you have to follow me because I'm the CEO, and if you don't, you're right. fired. Uh, or earning followership and people wanting to follow you. So what's the difference between the two, and how do you yeah. create that earned followership? What did you do? Yeah, you're you're right in that. You know, just by having the title chair of the board, CEO, um, you're you're going to internally going to get you know certain levels of respect, uh, just because you've got the job. And if you don't have the job, nobody does. And if you're not doing it, you know, there's 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 in the company over time. But ultimately, just because you have the title doesn't mean that people are going to follow. And to what I'm presuming will be one of the points of your book is you've got to earn their respect. And you've got to you've got to have credibility. Uh, you've got to have reliability. So you've got to have credibility to show those you're leading. I know what I'm talking about to some degree, yeah. which is why, why I think it would be almost impossible for a company as diverse and complex as Cargill for a CEO to come in from the outside. You've got mm-hmm. to have reliability when you get up in front of a group of people online, wherever it may be and say, here's where we're going to go. And here's what I want to get done in the next year, three years, five years. You got to deliver the results. You got to have sincerity. Uh, The way you communicate, whether you're going to call that authenticity or transparency, but you have to be perceived 
uh, by others that, okay, they're serious. They're sincere, they're sincere in what they're doing. And I think all of that leads to creating trust, organizational trust. People will follow you, even if the results might not be there for a while, if they trust you and if they, or if they perceive trust, if they don't know you. And I think that's the big difference, Jacob, which is the title is nothing if you don't earn an organization's trust through credibility, sincerity, yeah. reliability. And I think that's one of the secrets or the art forms to use your word of leadership. Yeah, so it seems like the the art side is more on the human connection piece, the vulnerability, the empathy, yep. the relationships. And the science side is probably more on the turning a profit side, growing the business side. So I thought maybe we could unpack yeah. those a little bit. So when you look at the science side of growing a business, and you know, obviously a lot yeah. of people watching and listening to this, they're not CEOs, but maybe they're running teams and maybe they're running functions. Yeah. When you were thinking about the science side of growing a business, how did you approach growth? Like, what did you yeah. look at? How did you make those decisions? Right. I think first and foremost is, you know, who, who's on my leadership team? You know, in, in many cases, I, I moved to Geneva, I moved to London, um, and you inherit leadership teams. And you yeah. have to pretty quickly assess who do I want on this team? Who's going to help me get to where we need to go? So that, that's the starting point. Secondly is, you know, what's our market position? Is it market share? Is it a differentiated uh, position relative to your competition? All the classic stuff you read from Michael Porter or other brilliant strategists. Is the market going to provide levels of growth that we need to sustain our own growth or that is expected from our own shareholders? And then who do you partner with? Because... You're never going to do anything. With, and partnering meaning, your, is it your customers? Are you going into joint ventures? How do you? And those those are very very hard things. And I think some of it comes from experience. Some of it comes from your own academic training. You know what you've learned, whether it was in business school or undergrad, or just from talking to other business people. But to, again, to use your phrase, the science of leadership or the science of growth. You've got to understand strategy. And the other thing I would say is you have to know how to execute. And there's some cliche or aphorism that I'll get wrong, but it's something like great execution will overcome a lousy strategy. Yeah. So you've got to know how to execute on your strategy because in, in, in a vacuum or in standalone per se, a great strategy will get you nowhere if you don't know how to put it into place, put it into action. And I think that's something you have to practice over the life of your career. When you talk about who you were surrounding yourself with, what were you looking for? And have there been several instances where you've had to change your leadership team, uh, you know, yeah. change who was around you? And what, what were those qualities and attributes that really helped you do your job more effectively? I think in every case where I came into an existing business with a leadership team, uh, I always made changes. Didn't change out the whole team. Um, but, you know, either they weren't suited for the job or they weren't the, the right fit for where we wanted to go. Uh, but it was almost uh, impossible not to change. I think I tried to have a mix of people that had great experience in the business or I say deep experience in the business and people that didn't. But I also always wanted to find people that were going to challenge me, not only intellectually, uh, but I would say verbally or strategically, I did not want a group of yes people. I wanted people, uh, you know, one of our leaders today uh, on the team that um, I was, you know, helped create and for, for Brian's current leadership team. Uh, one time she called me up and said, and she wasn't on the leadership team at the time. And she had seen a town hall that I'd done. And she said, you were pretty bad. And she went on to tell me why. But I thought, I like that kind of candor. And I think candor, and the, the thing is, you know, you're a student of leadership, Jacob. People, you do lose, going back to your previous question about preparing you for being the CEO, you lose some candor. You're, people are never going to be yeah. as candid with you when you're the CEO as they were beforehand. But I always look for people that would challenge me and have the candor to say, I just think you're wrong on this one. This is not... This was not a good decision, or you're missing these signals about this person, whatever it may be. 
You mentioned that for the first year you didn't uh, know what you were doing, which yeah, obviously partially in jest, but um, what do you mean by that? Because I feel like a lot of leaders, when they first get into leadership roles, they might feel that way too. And so kind of two-part question. One is, do you remember your first day as CEO when you first went into that office and first sat on the chair behind the desk and what that felt like? And why, what was that first year like? Like, are there any examples or situations you can think of where you were just kind of like, I have no idea what, like what, what's going on here? Yeah, it was, it was less, I have no idea what's going on, but it was more like, wow, I didn't expect this. Yeah. Or, okay, who do I go and talk to about this? And the answer is, mm, it's you. Yeah. Because you're, you're not going to call your board up and say, what should I do here? So Suddenly, and again, you read these this in leadership books, you are the person. You are the one making the decisions. And the other cliche you hear about CEOs, it's a lonely job. I'm here to tell you, it's true because you're on the spot. So my first day actually happened to be a Sunday and uh, the local newspaper had run an article on um, the transition. And I, th I thought, I don't feel any different today than uh, I did yesterday. But then when you go in the office and, you know, you go into your new office and you do feel different. But I, I look at my first year, my first months, four days into the job, we had a fatality at one of our businesses in Asia. And for me, safety is and always has been really, really important. And I thought, OK, four days in, unbelievable. But OK, what can we do? What did we miss? <clears throat> about two days later, I got a call from one of our uh, ag supply chain leaders who said we had six uh, boatloads of corn heading to be heading to China that was going to be rejected by the Chinese government because of the presence of a GMO that had not been approved. And we had to turn the ships around. And this was probably about a, a probably it was a multi, a, a deca million number. So less than a hundred million, but lots of millions. Yeah. And then about a month later, uh, we had a trading business. We traded uh, power generation at the time and we were short the power market. And we had what was then called the polar vortex, which meant really cold and that power and gas prices went really high. And when you're short a position, you lose money when the markets go up. So about 90 days in, had two major money losing positions and a fatality. And I started to think, you know, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but that's when you draw on your own experience on others, on your own, um, just your own soul, if you will, on, OK, I'm in charge. I'm responsible. I have to lead us through this and figure out how to present it to the organization and what are we going to do about it? Hmm. So how did you approach it? Because, uh, and it, I'm really curious because, you know, a lot of leaders, when you're in a mid or an entry level leadership role, to your point, if that happens, you have somebody to go to, you have somebody to call, yeah. you have somebody to, you know, Hey, take care of this. Like, I don't know what to do. Uh, obviously in your situation, you were that person, but these right. were also new situations and scenarios that you didn't have to be faced with or, or you weren't right. faced with before. So how did you approach them knowing that you haven't had to deal with this before? I think, um, you know, we, we, you've got to have some outlet to talk about you know, your, your, either the problems or the challenges. And I think, you know, you can talk about them. You're not within the company. You're not going to, to somebody, you know, in the organization say, hey, what should I do about this? But, you know, you can um, use it, use people as, as a sounding board or as a way to think through issues. And that's what I that's mm -hmm. one of my approaches to leadership, which is, OK, if this is a problem to be solved, I want to get other people's input and ask for their opinions. And it may not be my direct reports. It might be people outside the organization or but or somebody inside of the company. But ultimately, you've got to draw on your own experience and you've got to. I, th I think one of the skills of effective leadership is pattern recognition. OK, I, when I've seen this in the past, how did I handle it or perhaps more compellingly, how did other leaders that I saw and observed, how did they handle it? And when you watch leaders, you think, I would do it that way, or I would not do it that way. And so I think one skill that effective leaders have to have 
is pattern recognition. I've seen this before, maybe not exactly in this form, but I saw what worked and I've seen what didn't work. And so I'm going to choose what I saw worked or a derivative of that. And that's what I tried to do in the early days. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned pattern recognition because uh, so I, I play a lot of chess and I always recommend chess for, for a lot of leaders out there because one of, the, one of the things that you notice about playing a lot of chess is pattern recognition. Right. So in your case, um, even though you didn't have to deal with that exact situation before, what were some of the patterns that you were paying attention to? For example, fatalities or you know, a ship being turned away from, from China. If you didn't have to go through that exact scenario, what, was there something similar that you drew on as far as like how to handle that stuff? Yeah, I mean, if you look for th similar things. I mean, fatalities, when we have had them, it's always what can we learn from them? Because the uniqueness of uh, fatalities, each one is unique, you know, whether it might be in Indonesia or it might be in a mechanized plant in South America, each one has its unique circumstances. So I've always tried and we and Cargill has always, I think, done a good job of, OK, what can we learn from this? You know, what what and a fatality is a lagging indicator. Yeah. It, yeah. The, the events happened. What should we have done? What could we have done to prevent the fatality or injury? I think with trading markets, the lesson that I've taken away, the pattern recognition is markets come back and you, you get um, panic in markets, whether to the upside or the downside, but eventually they come back to equilibrium. But Animal Spirits, which is that book that I, I, I read several years ago, which talks about the, the content of human emotion on decisions Part of, I think, pat pattern recognition, Jacob, is, okay, is this being driven by emotion or is it markets or is it a one-off? Is there some type of pattern? But ultimately, when there's a situation like this, maybe it was a bad decision or maybe a bad circumstance, what can I learn from it so that I can recognize the pattern the next time this happens hmm. or that I, you know, I can make better and more informed decisions because of my learning? And I think in addition to pattern recognition, Constant learning and betterment for an organization and for a leader is, I think, one of the greatest strengths you can have. Kind of a random side note, but a, a question that I'm always curious about. Uh, as the CEO of such a big company, did you have, I don't know if you want to call it a war room or a situation room, but, uh, you know, kind of because obviously you were dealing with so many different things and countries and ships and plants did you have a kind of a situation room where you would go in there and get like regular daily briefings and people were giving you news about what's going on in the world? Or how did, how did you start your days running this massive global empire? Like what, what was that process, the inputs that you were getting? I'd say in, in just in typical times, no, it was not daily briefings. I mean, I, I am an early riser. And so my pattern was my habits were I got up early I was checking my email, you know, sometimes with a little trepidation, like, okay, what happened overnight? <laughs> um, just, and just what is happening in the world overnight? And, and sometimes, just, I remember I was managing our energy business in Geneva in, I think it was 2003, might have been 2004, and Saddam Hussein was captured in Iraq. Hmm. And so we knew in the energy markets were going to really be volatile. We weren't sure it was going to go up or down, but... So we convened a call it was on a Sunday afternoon to say, OK, what do we expect in terms of markets and risk management? What can we do? We did actually once upon a time have a room called the situation room. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't use it for situations, but it just was called that. But where we've had, say, daily briefings or um, it's been more where there's been a crisis or something that's got uh, the crucible of time to it. So going back to pattern recognition. COVID, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, significant inflation and significant supply chain disruptions. I am lucky. Those came in the last three years of my being a CEO. Had they come in my first three years, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. But I had, you know, six years under my belt. And so I felt confident and I had the team that was going to lead us through this. But especially in COVID, we were meeting with our leadership team and we had regional crisis action teams every day 
okay, what do we know? What plants have had significant outbreaks? Where is our supply chain breaking down? So our daily briefings or call it situation monitoring was more around things like COVID, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, other events, as opposed to something daily where, gosh, I can't, the company this big and to your point, this complex, I I can't absorb it all. That's why you got to make sure you have the right leaders in place. When you look at the the course of your career, what do you think the greatest challenge was that you were faced with? Um, and can you talk about how you approached it? it, it gosh, it has it had to be COVID. And I, I'm not alone in that. Cargill's not alone in that. Yeah. But nobody knew. You know, I, we, some friends of mine and some former CEOs and current CEOs kind of laugh about it. Like, hey, remember, you know, it was the last day we were in the office was March 13th. And nobody's ever, you know, we have never been back to full strength, full occupation in the, in the building. <clears throat> but we're at first it's like, okay, this is probably going to blow over in a couple yeah. weeks. And I was like, oh, well, by Memorial Day, we'll be back. And then we'll, but you'll be back by Labor Day. And next thing you know, it's 2023. And, and so that was a situation where, you know, we were all unmoored or untethered and taking things you really had to be tactical in a daily way. When do we close a plant? You know, what kind of outbreak do we have in different facilities? How do we keep people safe? And so it was the, the, the responsibility for us, for me as a CEO, but for us as a leadership team was put people first. Every decision that we make should have at the heart of it, how are we keeping our teams safe? And recognizing we had this responsibility to put food on the shelves of the world. And, you know, that dynamic tension between the two. But when it came to if we've got an outbreak at one of our facilities, one of our beef plants feeds 23 million people a day. Wow. Uh, Yes. So it is not insignificant if we've got to shut down. But it is not insignificant if we have an outbreak of dozens of employees. And we didn't know. I mean, COVID was severe, really severe, as you know, then. But it was we're going to close down. And, you know, we'll figure out how to reroute supply chains. But I felt that we as a company made values-based decision, do the right thing, put people first. And when you lead through with your values, it answers the technical questions that ultimately arise when you're making those decisions. Hmm. What do you think the greatest failure or mistake was during your time as CEO? I think... um, I, I, and again, this is something, I'd be, you know, I'm sure you have studied this and have heard this, but as I've read and observed leadership, whether it was through their own oral history or written history, one of the common refrains was, I didn't act quickly enough. Hmm. And, you know, I had an instinct, I knew what I wanted to do, but I let it sit. And you get the benefit of hindsight, obviously, once you've stepped out of the CEO role or after an event happens. But it's true. And, you know, one of the, my famous, not famous, but re, I like a phrase I like to re, repeat, problem, unlike wine, problems do not age well with time. <laughs> and you've got to run at them and you've got to get in front of them fast. And so I think there were some people decisions I made along the way where... I either ignored other people's advice or I thought, you know, I can help this person change their leadership style or their skills. And I was wrong. And, you know, it's difficult to unwind people decisions, especially when you start getting into different levels, C-suite levels. But so I I think, you know, that if I had to do over again, I either would have listened more carefully to people's concerns or moved more quickly. Um, but ultimately, I try not to have too many regrets or, you know, not dwell on the mistakes, but not all, you know, not all acquisitions. There was an acquisition that we made where we had not been as thorough in our due diligence as we should have been. We didn't get a, a transition services agreement from the seller, um, and it was not a good acquisition. So that, you know, there, there's, there's certainly a litany of things I'd, I'd like to have to do over again if I could. This episode is made possible by Avpoint. 
No matter how big your business is or what it does, Avpoint can help modernize your digital workplace by rapidly reducing costs, improving productivity, and protecting your data with their renowned confidence platform. Go to avpoint.com today for a free consultation and to learn more. That's A V E P O I N T.com. Avpoint.com. It's interesting that you mentioned the the thing about talent and people because I'd say from all the CEOs and there's been hundreds over the years that I've interviewed on this podcast yeah. the number one mistake that everybody says they made is uh either hiring somebody and having them be in their situation in their role for too long, you know, not getting rid of them or firing them sooner. And I'm always interested like why how does that happen for CEOs? Right? You would you would think that if you're the CEO of a company and again, this is from like, I kid you not, 90 plus percent of the CEOs have all told me that has been their greatest mistake. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm always trying to figure out like, why, like, how could that be the greatest mistake is the CEO of the company, you know, maybe for a hiring manager or a mid-level leader. How do you explain that, that this is so common for CEOs as far as their biggest regret or mistake? It's always a person that they wish they would have transitioned sooner. Well, first of all, I'm relieved that this 90% that I'm part of the 90% that I wasn't unique. Secondly, is you got to do something about this, Jacob. You have this impact and this ability to influence CEOs from making the mistakes. So take your knowledge, but all kidding aside, I think, as I said, when we first started speaking, you get to a CEO job or a C-suite job because you have great empathy. You have a great ability to connect with people, to lead them. And you form deep personal connections. I think the best leaders I've ever been with, and I'd like to think that I had some of this, but I, I was able to form personal connections with many, not all, of the people that I work with. And therefore, if you have to uncouple that connection through a form of a termination or a reassignment, it, sh it does not and should not come easily. Hmm. Now, some... For some, it's very easy, like, sorry, got to go. And I think you develop that skill of, okay, I, I made a, a poor people decision or I, you know, the Peter principle, I over promoted somebody, I've got to correct it. And I got to be better at correcting it more quickly uh, than letting it linger and letting it age poorly. But I think that's what it is, Jacob. I think it's, you have that compassion that you, and you, and I think you also have, Perhaps you have um, persuaded yourself of, okay, I can help mold them or lead them in a constructive way that will make them either more productive or more successful. And oftentimes it's not the case. And, and again, listen to your inner voice, listen to your instinct. But I, I think that's where the 90% that you've met and talk, spoken to probably fail in that regard. If you were to think back uh, as far as a moment the most impacted or shaped who you are as a leader, and it could be, you know, absolutely anything, is there something that happened in your life that really shaped who you are as a leader? I moved a lot as a kid. Um, and so I was always uh, changing, uh, you know, going to a new school, making new friends, going into a new community. Uh, my wife and I, we moved our family a couple times to Europe and back. And I think, you know, having the resilience of starting over or going through difficult personal moments as a, as a child, I think gave me a resilience and a mm -hmm. flexibility that you need to have as a CEO. Uh, it's, it's not for everybody. Um, yeah. You've got to be able to roll with the punches. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, change and and I often said in Cargill, I said, the pace of change will never be slower than it is today. You've got to be comfortable. And the other, you know, I, I, I remember going in thinking, you know, I'm not going to use a lot of cliches and aphorisms. And I realized I do, but it's a shorthand for communicating. But I kept this quote, the, the, Dar the Darwin quote in my desk. It's not the strongest. It's not the smartest that survive. It's the most adaptable to change. And so uh, for me, experiential, experientially, when you ask that question, I don't know if it was one moment, but it was living a life of continuous change and continuous learning that I think shaped my career as a CEO and uh, in business in general. Hmm. Yeah, that's. Uh, I remember I talked to Frank Blake. Do you know Frank Blake? 
I have met him before. He's a really nice man. Yeah, and a great. Leader. The, the former CEO of the Home Depot, and uh, he's he's one of the CEOs I had on on this show, and uh, we talked about this concept of do more, care more, where he said that what a lot of people forget when they step into the role of a leader or into the leader's shoes is that leaders do more and they care and they care more. So it's, yeah. it's part, and not every, not every leader thinks that way, but that's how leaders need to think. A lot of leaders think that, well, I'm in this role now, I can relax, you know, I, I got the nice salary mm-hmm. and the benefits and, you know, I can, you know, delegate and stuff like that. But it's actually harder to become a leader. It's harder to be a leader now than I think it ever has been. So do you, do you think that framework of do more, care more makes sense? Did you find yourself frequently caring more and working more and, and, you know, doing more than those around you? I don't know about doing more, but, care, you know, I, I, it's, you know, it's, I, I understand what Frank was trying to say. And, I, you know, as I said, I've met him a couple of times. He wouldn't know me if I walked into his office. But I remember one thing that he told me about, which really stuck with me, was that he on Sundays would write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you notes or, and I did that and I had, I had done it before he had said it. It it wasn't the first time I thought of it, but one of the interesting things as I transitioned from out of being CEO was it's, you know, it's a, it's a living um, memoriam. People come out and start saying, you know, I remember when you did this, or do you remember this picture? And what struck me perhaps the most was that people remembered the notes that I had handwritten to them. And a couple of them, I mean, it's it's really a humbling position to have yeah. this job. You're leading people and, and, and trying to inspire them and connect with them. But some of them had framed the note that I had written them. Wow. And I thought, I don't, I don't know that I deserve that. But the fact that you, they honored me by saying, I cared that you sent me this note. And that I took the time to write the note, but whether I was on plant visits or I got word that somebody had just joined the company, had done a tremendous job of landing a new account, you know, personal recognition. I'm going to go back to one of my sayings, which is people don't remember what you said or what you did as a leader. They remember how did you make them feel? Mm. And if you made them feel respected and honored, um, and valued. That's what I think leadership is. So yeah. when CEOs do more, care more, I wouldn't put myself above my peers, our team, others in the company. But one of the things I've noticed the most in since handing over the job five years, uh, I'm sorry, five months ago, is I, I'm less preoccupied with what's going on in the company or what's going to be in my email in the morning. And so it's, a, a, it's, you know, a liberating sense of the emotions and the responsibility that goes with leading a big company and feeling we're being responsible for their health, their safety, their wellness, and caring about them as individuals, but also their families and their loved ones. So the theme of what Frank was saying, I totally endorse mm-hmm. and agree with. So the last uh, 15 minutes or so uh, is a segment I like to call the Leader's Toolkit. And for the Leader's Toolkit, I like to focus on a couple uh, specific actionable things that leaders can implement uh, in their leadership journeys. And so I thought we would start this Leadership Toolkit by asking, what do you do when you're in a situation? Obviously, you, you're the CEO, you're in the process of wanting to make a decision, and you have people around you who disagree in terms of the advice that they're giving you. So maybe yep. it's a strategic business decision or an acquisition or what to do, and you know you have... One person around you that says, Dave, you should do this. And you have somebody else that says, no, that's stupid, Dave. Don't do that. Do this. Yeah. How do you deal with that when you surround yourself with people? And you said you want them to challenge you, but when they yeah. disagree and there's no clear course of action or um, you know, a- agreement, <laughs> how do you make a decision? My conversation with Dave continues, and you're not going to want to miss it. Available only for paid subscribers at greatleadership.substack.com. And in this bonus episode, Dave is going to share how to balance what works today and driving change versus getting out of your comfort zone. In other words, how do you focus on driving business today while also thinking about the future? Dave is also going to share a time and several times actually where he is the CEO had to make a decision where members of his team disagreed with each other. So how did he make that decision? 
what um, are the data points, what is the insight that he was able to collect from his team to be able to make that decision even though his team members disagreed. He's also gonna talk about how to build trust, uh, the best piece of advice that he has on how to become a good leader, and also how to balance growing the business while also taking care of your employees. So it's a really in-depth, fascinating bonus conversation. Again, only available for paid subscribers. Head over to greatleadership.substack.com and you can subscribe over on that platform. Uh, for those of you who do subscribe, you're gonna get access to a weekly bonus episode. You'll get access to a weekly in-depth article that I write around a leadership trend, an insight, a discovery, a piece of research. And lastly, you're gonna get a weekly five-minute video where I share a leadership hack or a strategy that a CEO has shared with me. All of this is available at greatleadership.substack.com. I hope to see you over there and I'll see you next week.